McLeod. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and emotional wellness coach, and I help people do the brain work for resolving symptoms of anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress, and traumatic stress, really. Um, I'm going to move this back because it seemed like it was farther back and that it just zoomed in really close. Um, I wanted to jump on today and uh, go live and I wanted to talk about three more agreements commonly made with PTSD and three more uh, distorted agreements. These are agreements that seem kind of okay. There's some truth in them, but the truth is distorted. Um, I really feel like this is so, I did a vis video yesterday about three common ones. Um, and gosh, I had to take from a little, from this list that I made, that I've observed within myself, I've seen within clients, and I've just seen as this is how you relate to um, PTSD and, um, and come out really stuck and come out really confused and kind of chewed up by PTSD. And um, and so I, I highlighted those and in yesterday's video, but gosh, today there's just more, there's just more. And I have more, I mean, I can't even stop writing them. Um, and so I'm probably gonna make another video um, tomorrow, but um, I'm batching them in three because this is a long list. And some of them are in the same families. Um, I, I'm doing this because I think that it's important that we can um, we shed the light on this because it is so confusing. Um, it's so confusing when if we're the ones who have PTSD, um, it can be so confusing to live with this and we don't know how to get out. And I will tell you some of the answer is in not making these agreements. Um, and if you're living with or, or have been raised with, by someone with PTSD, uh, you are familiar with these agreements, whether you have made them or whether you're conscious of them or not. So I'm hoping that by seeing this stuff, the light bulbs will go off and you will find ways to untangle yourself. And um, even it, especially if you have PTSD, you can be like, hey, hold up, something's not right here. And this is what it is. And this is not the agreement that I'm going to make. And some of this stuff is, is really standing up to some of these things and finding our way through and out through finding what's true, finding the lies, dropping the lies, um, and dropping the distortions. Um, I, I love how brains resolve distortions, and I could totally nerd out about that, and I think I will another time. Um, but right now, we're just working on, we don't want to make any distorted agreements. Um, so, because the faster we get out of this, the better. We can heal from PTSD and we can take our lives back. We can live very healthy having recovered from this or having recovered from being in a relationship with someone with PTSD. And like I said in the last video, if you're somebody who has been in a relationship or in close contact and you've made these disagreements, these agreements, um, chances are you're probably experiencing some PTSD as well. And so... And so you want to not make more agreements with this and continue to get tangled up with this. If you were raised with people that had PTSD and you didn't have a lot of trauma, but you still have symptoms of PTSD, this is why. We are sharing nervous systems. Children are getting our nervous system. If you're a parent and you have children, uh, this these agreements, your children could be making these agreements with you. And um, But also they are getting this from your nervous system. That's why it's so important to heal because also in addition to the fact that you're giving them this stuff, um, as you heal, you're giving them the, the solution as well. You're, and it's, it's really beautiful because um, this is something I've seen in my own family because I had complex childhood trauma um, from generations of traumatized people. And um, I started my healing work after I already had three children. So I have passed on some of this stuff and um, I've also passed on the healing. And my children, what I've noticed is they have such a great um, emotional intelligence. And, um, and it's like they're calling out mental illness all the time. They're, they're calling out codependence. They're calling out these things. And they're not attracted in the least. And so it, it's worth it to heal. 
Um, and this is something that I see in my teenage clients that they are, gosh, they're healing from this. So I wouldn't even say, don't be ashamed if, if you have this, if you have, if you were, if you've given this to somebody else, just heal really. Cause that really undoes so much. A, an ounce of healing is worth pounds of talking, pounds of worrying about if you're giving this to somebody else or not. So, um, but I want you to have your heads up about the, um, these agreements. So we'll talk about them. I also want to invite you, if I'm saying anything that resonates, I want you to put a thumbs up. If you have questions, please post your questions here. If you have comments, post them. I will read them when I have a moment. Um, it might be at the end, it might be um, in the middle. We'll see what happens. Um, so uh, also, if you, this can really help, understanding these dis, these distorted agreements can really help you if you have PTSD and you're asking people to make these with you or you're making them yourself. And as, the, the, as soon as you become aware of this, your brain can begin to shift it and you can start interacting with it much differently. That is half the battle. And so we need to, there's, there's reasons why that are really important inside you that have to be processed. Your brain needs to get its hands on, because I'm sure there are hands in your brain that get in there and like, okay, I've got this, and process it and heal it. Um, these are not things that, these are, this is where the magic happens. If you can catch your brain red-handed asking for these agreements, then you have, you have the access point to tremendous healing below. So don't look these things over. Don't be ashamed of them. See them for what they are and deal with them appropriately. Um, okay, the, the first distorted agreement that I'm going to talk about, um, which is for counting yesterday's list, is I will drop my boundaries for you. Um, PTSD is frequently asking for this, especially complex childhood trauma. Um, complex PTSD is asking for this a lot, especially because what comes out of there is such a deep insecurity and such a so much unresolved emotion like fear and hurt and woundedness that it's like it's it's almost like it, there's a shaking inside that needs to be stabilized, and there's that secure attachment that's needed, and um, and so and since they didn't get it from a parent, they're still looking for it. And so when, and that parent child thing is not a, it's not, there's not a lot of boundaries there. Um, they get access to your body. They get access to your time, to your sleep schedule. They get access to um, your preferences, what kind of clothing you wear, what you do with your activities and your time. And um, that devotion is part of building a secure nervous system, right? And so, but just because people grow up, that doesn't necessarily leave, let that insecurity leave the nervous system. That has to be processed out by that person's brain. Brains are ready to do this at any time. We don't all know how to do this yet, um, but you can learn how to do this very quickly. But that insecurity, when that comes out of the nervous system, all of a sudden they don't need that same thing anymore. They don't need what a child would need. And because that... Um, their own system resolved it. It would have been nice if it would have been done, this security, this secure attachment work would have been done in childhood. That's where, where it's supposed to. But if it doesn't, the system will still need that. And it will continue to need that kind of attachment work until it gets this, this insecurity out. And so in done unwell, this, this knowledge can have people really asking people to drop all their boundaries for them. Give me all your time. Um, give me all your attention. Give me all your money. Give me all your security. Um, have no boundaries. Go to sleep when I let you go to sleep. Wake up when I need you to wake up. Um, uh, drop the way that you naturally live and take care of me. Be with me. Um, and this is this can be very subtle. It can be very um, overt. Um, but it is really just the need that's in somebody's nervous system, somebody's inner self shaking and needing to be comforted and regulated. Um, and it, this is this is a distortion because there's some truth that if you do the regulation work for somebody or yourself, it will work. It will work. If you do it for yourself, it's perfect. It's your when you become an adult, um, your ability to soothe yourself matches you perfectly. If you can get yourself regulating and you can, you are healing and you are resolving this issue. 
um, we can get some of the support from other people and that's beautiful as well. Um, and, and that can be, that's part of co-regulation, right? Um, nervous systems do this, especially in childhood. And um, we're learning how to, our parents are actually have the ability to regulate us. Uh, and our nervous system is learning that at some point the nervous system says, oh, this is how you do it. And so it starts doing it itself. And so it's starting to build its own skill to do that regulation thing. Uh, when we're an adult, we can really start this practice ourselves. We can start regulating ourselves. We can start that practice. And that is such a great match with us. And then when other people help, it's help, not need. That is a big difference between post -traumatic, healthy, um, unhealthy post-traumatic stress uh, responses and agreements and really healthy agreements is want. I want to help you, not I need to help you or our worlds are going down, right? That's a survival state right there that I just did. Um, I need you to help me. I need you to drop these. I need you to stay with me tonight. I need you to, I need you to drop your friends. I need you not to have any other friends in me. I need you to, that, that is someone under the influence of their survival state, their survival system. And that does, that is not where, where health comes from. That is not where thriving comes from. That is where hit and miss and survival stuff comes from. And a lot of times when our um, when our parents, we were born into these parents that are that have this trauma or perpetuating this trauma, and we hear the message early from them, I need you to, I need, the, I need you to stay close to me. I need you to never leave me. I need you to never tell me I did something wrong. I need you to think I'm good. I need you to. I can't, I don't, I can't have you tell me about what I did wrong. I can't handle it. Right. And so that, it, you know, it's different when you say, I want you to hold me in high esteem. I want you to be close to me. You know, I want that. And it's okay if it doesn't happen. Right. I'm not going to fall apart. This is not a survival. It's not like I'm losing oxygen over it. My nervous system is not acting like I'm, I'm, I'm losing oxygen. I might assert my survival is in danger over it. And, um, and that can be the energy that, that you find that you're losing your boundaries or that you, you learn never to assert a boundary, never keep me out, never, um, never, never, never hold your boundary, drop your boundaries. And this is why a lot of times I will find people who um, their trauma, their post-traumatic stress disorder is around their boundaries being violated like this over and over again by needing to be the emotional support, by needing to be the one their parents talk to about their marital distress, by needing to be the one that doesn't make any mistakes so that mom can look good or dad can look good in the community, right? That's what their post-traumatic stress disorder is about. That's what they're having flashbacks about, and that's real. And so a lot of that stuff is learning to have boundaries again. And this is nervous system work. Just like it, just like it's nervous system work when somebody's grabbing at your your boundaries and put your boundaries down. Um, it's it's our nervous systems are impacted by this. But this agreement, I'll drop my boundaries for you, is not is not an agreement to make with PTSD. As a matter of fact, boundaries are some of the kindest things you can do in a brain that is in in a post traumatic stress. It's not always it's this is a distortion, right? When we talk about distortion, we're talking about all or nothing. We're talking about extremes. Um, there really is a time for everything under the sun, and it's there's about it's it's about the wisdom to know which strategy to, which strategy to use when. So I'm never saying, you know, don't set a boundary aside for a moment. I it, it doesn't sound like a great idea, but I'm sure there would be just that right time that would show up in life that that sounds like the idea. Um, I I'm not here to judge that. I, I trust you to use your wisdom or to do your best. But to what happens is this becomes instinctual. It becomes lightning fast. You just find you're dropping your boundaries. Next thing you know, your boundaries, you don't even remember them. Um, they've been obliterated or your nervous system has been trained to just leave them down. And this means that you can't protect yourself. You can't keep yourself well. Our, our, even our cells, right? Our boundaries are to put in, to bring in what we want and need and to keep out what we don't want and we don't need. And so if you, if, if our cells, if that boundary, that wall dropped, it would, it would either absorb everything and, 
and not survive, or it would block everything out and not survive. These boundaries are vital to our wellness. Some of our mental illness, our anxiety, our depression, our, our post-traumatic stress, our flashbacks, this is just because we do not have the boundaries in place that we need, and we don't have them because our nervous system literally cannot, has been conditioned to not assert the boundaries, not like the use the boundaries function doesn't work any longer. And it can happen because we've made these agreements, because we've heard these unspoken agreements and we've responded to them. And we've learned through close interactions that this is the agreement. And this agreement is a distortion and it is harmful and it is painful. And, um, and it is, it is, you can recover from this. You can get your nervous system really showing boundaries a lot more, even with people you never thought you could. Um, this is, this is something that I see clients. I, I remember clients saying, I can't believe I said that to my mom and it was kind and it was assertive. And, you know, I can't believe I said this to my husband. I can't believe I said this to, I said it, I said, I held a boundary, um, because nervous boundaries don't have to be created. Boundaries have to be liberated. Your nervous system is sitting on them. It's like, no boundaries, not safe to have boundaries, right? And so it's sitting on your boundaries, but really the work is to get, to clear the trauma, to clear the, that off of your boundaries and liberate them. And pretty soon they're out um, and they're active, which is really a, a wonderful thing to start seeing. And um, boundaries, I'm, I, I'm going to go off on boundaries for a moment. I am going to talk about the other two things. Um, Boundaries are so magical because a lot of times when people are in um, are in PTSD states or they they have a, a post traumatic stress disorder, um, and it's and it's affecting their relationship or any of their relationships. Um, they're in a survival state often, and that means their prefrontal cortex, their thinking center, is shut down. Um, they're in feeling states there and they're, they're doing a lot of emotional reasoning um, and feeling past trauma flooding through their system. Their thinking center really um, brain fMRIs show the brain function minimized to about 20% of effectivity. So we can't really think. And so a lot of times people want to reason with people in, in, in states of, of trauma and, um, that part of the brain is not available. It's not, it's not, it's not functioning. It has been shut down. It is under the, um, the protection guidance, um, leadership of the survival system. And so, and it will be defended by the survival system as a matter of fact as well. Another topic for another time, but, um, boundaries don't communicate with the prefrontal cortex. Healthy boundaries start communicating with the subconscious mind which you can do tremendous amounts of transformation through your subconscious mind. And so it's, it's so important that we set the boundaries that not that we get people to agree with the boundaries, to understand the boundaries, to give us permission to set the boundaries, but that we actually set the boundaries. So it's so important that your nervous system liberates them because now you're actually creating change within yourself and within the other person at, uh, through, through the subconscious mind. This is not a pretty thing. If it's not, anyway, I could go on. I, I, this is like the fifth part of my, my program and it's a hefty part. Um, but it's really, really powerful to understand how magical boundaries are, um, how powerful and how healing boundaries are. I remember putting boundaries up for the first time. I thought the world was going to come to an end because in my family, boundaries were unkind and you did not. Don't be mean, Rachel. Stop being so mean. Um, and um, I remember setting boundaries as an adult and it was, it was like my stomach was in knots over it. And, um, and I said no for the first time. I was one of those people that couldn't say no. I come from a line of people, of women who can't say no. Um, and, um, I, I said, no. And I, my whole system shrunk up like this. And then they were like, oh, okay. Sounds good. Good idea. Okay. And they walked off and I was like, <sighs> I, I mean, I, I, I took my nervous system through a marathon in that one small, very short amount of time. And, um, things started changing. 
it was so crazy. I was like, there were problems that I was like, I don't even know how I'm going to solve these problems. And all of a sudden I say one thing and three, four things shift that I was like, I don't even know. And I was like, mm, there's something about these boundaries. And I would set more boundaries in terror in, in abject terror, because I really wasn't tapping a whole lot. Then I had found tapping, but I didn't have, I wasn't using it, the tool that I could use it as. And so I was just, white knuckling this terror stuff, which I do not recommend. Um, and I just kept setting, I kept hearing my boundary and I'd set it and I'd hear it and I'd set it. And it was like, problem solved, problem solved. I was like, this is crazy. Who, who knew? Who knew that the trick was in healthy boundaries? I did not know. Now I know. I've seen it over and over again. And it's not just me. It's my clients too. And they come back and they're like, <laughs> listen here, Rachel. And so, and I am all about listening because tell me, I want to hear all about it. Um, the transformations that boundaries make, because it still is mind boggling to me. Um, it, it, the thing that we fear the most um, in the face of, of mental illness is, is setting boundaries. Often, often, often. And they're the thing that is the most magical. Crazy town. And it matches brain function perfectly. Okay, so um, don't make that agreement to drop your boundaries. You're not helping. It will make it worse. So when, you're, when your PTSD says to you to drop your boundaries, don't make the agreement. And if somebody else is asking you to drop your boundaries, do not make the agreement. Um, the second agreement with PTSD is I will let you in all the way. It's part of the no boundaries thing, but I really wanted to highlight it a little more. I will let you in all the way. It doesn't matter um, if you have the skill set to be in my intimate, intimate space, right? Because we're still have someone who's needing safety so much that they need to be in your nervous system, right? It, our nervous systems do regulate each other. Um, they need to be in your protection. They need to be in your, your attachment. They need to be bonded. They need, they need that still, which there's healthy ways to do this. Um, and there are unhealthy ways to do this. And this right here is one of the unhealthy ways to do this is I will let you in all the way. We have boundaries in our inner world and we have our innermost self. And then we have, um, selves that are, you know, like at the store, we share space. We have a bubble, right? We share the space. And then we have people that we like a little bit and we'll let them pat us on the back or shake our hand or, you know, on the outside. Right. And then we have people that will hear our thoughts. And that's a, another step in. And then we'll hear people that have our emotions. And um, that's another step in. And then we have the, the jewels, the core essence of us, our insecurities, our, our most valuable moments, our, our things we hold the most precious, um, great memories, things like that, and just who we are. And um, a lot of times with PTSD, we can, uh, there's this, there's this brush into the, the most holy places of um, or, or just even past the person's skill set. Um, some people don't have the skills to be in that far. And yet we're letting them in because that's one of the agreements we make with PTSD. And, 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 and in, in this list is, is like, there's even more agreements in here. I won't protect myself. I'll let you do with whatever with me. I need, because there's a sense with PTSD and people with PTSD, not everybody, let me say that, this is not how it all works, um, but there's a sense of, I need to prove myself to you. I, can, I need to prove that I can treat your PTSD well. And this, this locks us into, I'll prove myself, right? That's like a bonus distortion. You do not need to prove yourself. And that's all I'm going to say on that note right now. But, um, yeah. And, and, but you'll let them all the way in, even though they're not safe right now. Um, humans in a survival state are not safe. Um, the survival part of the brain only cares about the self. And it's, I think of this part of us as our wild animal self, right? This is the one that's going to flee. This is the one that's going to fight, claw and scratch, not because of logic. Because the emotion that's surfacing, and remember in PTSD, the emotion that's surfacing is old. It's not even has, it has nothing to do with today. You have no control over what is surfacing and running through someone's nervous system in those moments. And so, and there's not a lot of logic, and please don't expect there to be a lot of logic. 
And I think in working with tons of people and having this myself, I don't think any of us are thrilled when we do, uh, when we get triggered and we tear somebody up or we tear up things that are important to somebody else. Like, please don't let people in to tear your stuff up. That doesn't make them a better person. It doesn't make them happier. It doesn't, it, when they come out of their state, there's usually a big shame spiral because they don't want to hurt anybody. And because we're in these agreements, they're hurting lots of people, which makes this thing worse. It makes them feel more unsafe. It makes them feel more vulnerable. It makes them feel more worthless. It makes them feel more See, it's like, it's like all these agreements that are distorted lead to more and more and more dysfunction. And it makes this illness grow. It makes it grow. We think because we're programmed to do this. If you have a family line like mine, where you've been doing this dysfunction thing for generations, this comes in the bottle, like in the water. Uh, this isn't even a second thought. And so these agreements just seem very natural. If you're new to this game and you think mm, this isn't quite right, it's not. It's not right. This is, does not lead to health. This leads to pain. And pain is what keeps this disorder flowing and in charge and, and causing havoc. Um, we let people in all the way, even though um, they're not demonstrating that they're trustworthy in these areas because they actually don't have the skills to be in this close to us. And we need to be, it's totally fine to move people in and out and in and out. That's not like right now you can be close. Yeah, oh, hold up. Now you're out. So that, you know, and, and finding that healthy spot, not just, oh, you were in once, so you get to stay in. Um, no, right now, you're, this is not a good time for you to be in close. Um, also, even though, I have my list here. Even though the person is currently in a brain state that... Um, that there, it's not even possible for them to consider your perspective and your needs in those moments. The survival system does not consider anybody else but their own survival. That's how we're wired. I, 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 I don't want you to feel ashamed of that or mad at somebody else because this is who we are. You get pushed into a survival state, the only thing you care about is your survival. That's why we don't want to parent from the survival state. We want, to, we want to be in the part of our brain that considers multiple perspectives. That's our prefrontal cortex. That's the part that gets shut down in a survival state. So uh, that's so it's like it's, it's we're, we're, we're letting people in to this really precious space within us. And then they don't have, they can't appreciate it. Um, they can't protect it. They can't do anything but survive in it. And that might be like grabbing your stuff and covering it over their head with it. Your most precious jewels. Um, they might be selling it. I mean, I'm not, they're not, that's not what I'm talking about, but I, I'm, I'm making up a little story here, but just to just show you, this is not what you want. And, and ultimately this is not what they're going to want because as soon as they come out of this, as soon as their survival system shuts down, and says, oh, okay, we're safe now. And their thinking center turns back on. That's awful. So don't make these agreements. Don't make that agreement to let them in all the way. Or to, if, let, me, let me show you this if it's your own disorder. Um, it really wants to start saying what's wrong with me, right? It wants to know this stuff right here. It doesn't get to ask that right now. And we're not answering you right now. This is not the time for that. And you can't have the precious things, right? There's, uh, um, this thing wants to come in and, and criticize you. And it wants to come in and, and really destroy all the things that you worked hard to build when you were not in a survival state because the pain is, is, is doing what pain does. And so this is really an important thing, too, is, is learning to keep stuff out, learning to keep some things in. There's strategies for this. Um, shifting into observation is really important. Also, this is a great time to use an intervention. It's a wonderful time to use an intervention. It's like if it's going to come up, let's process it. Let's not entertain it. Come on in. Let me show you all the things that are wrong with you that aren't really wrong with you, but your survival system is programmed poorly. And so it just goes and just starts throwing things off your mental shelf and your emotional shelf. And the next thing you know, you got a whole puddle of mess now. And don't let it all the way in. 
don't let it take tours and talk trash about how you've designed your inner world or what's in there. It just doesn't get to do that. And so if you've made an agreement, like all your, uh, all PTSD has to do is ask you a couple questions and then you hand over all the jewels. No, hear me tell you that's not right. And I get it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> My clients get it. Um, it, it. You're not alone in that. It is, it is a very powerful force. So, but it don't make that agreement. Um, the third agreement is I will keep you safe. And you're not going to keep it safe. You're not going to keep the person safe with PTSD. Um, the, the lack of safety is running in their nervous system. It's not possible. You cannot keep them safe. You cannot help them feel safe. Safety is created by the brain. If, it's, if their brain is not going to create safety, it's not happening. Um, if they're dealing with paranoia, that's a safety thing. Their brain needs to fix that. You cannot make somebody feel safe. You can participate. There's some things you can do. If you're really good at this brain work, there's some really cool things you can do. But really, you can't make somebody feel safe. Brains make people feel safe. Nervous systems make people feel safe. And so right off the jump, it's this is just not, this is distorted thinking. There's not truth to this. You can be a healthy person that's actually safe to be around, but that's not going to guarantee that they're not going to be hit by a flashback or you're going to do something that triggers that they're, um, some of their emotional flashbacks, like their feelings of I'm not good enough. Nobody wants me. I'm, I'm, I'm just to be rejected. You can't stop that. You can't do things enough so that they don't feel these ways. And you can't do enough things so that you don't feel these ways. The only way to get out of this is to get your brain to resolve these issues. That's how this stops. And brains can do this. Your brain can do this. I haven't seen a brain yet who can't do it. And I have worked with people with Alzheimer's. I have worked with people with intellectual disabilities. They already have cognitive impairments. Their brains do this. This is a process that is just awesome, native to brain, and doesn't require the cognitive part of us. Um, so, but yeah, this one is like, I'll keep you safe. This one has like tons of agreements, like I'll protect you. Um, I won't let anyone trigger you. Um, I won't let you rock. I won't, I won't rock your boat. This one. This one just, this one just doesn't work. I, th I, I think that's. This, there's just not a way to do this. And, and it's really, this is, this is one of the lies that makes us isolated from others, right? We've, we, then we learn we have to protect them from other people's observations. We have to protect them from other people's comments. We have to protect, we have to protect ourselves from other people's conversations. We have to protect ourselves from things that could happen. Um, we have to protect ourselves from those conversations that we're afraid of having, those conflicts, those, right? It, it just grows. This one just grows. It's not true. I will keep you safe. It's not true. It's not, um, it doesn't work like this. And to make an agreement like this is you're going to fail. And then you're going to feel like you have failed. And then they're going to feel like you have failed. And everyone is going to think that you have failed. And then you're going to have this failure thing that you're going to need to deal with that's going to go into your nervous system because it's not logical, but it is very much a big, real feeling that is gathering evidence all the time. Subconscious minds love evidence, even if it's wrong evidence. And you don't want something like this to start building evidence that you failed, that you can't even keep them safe. It's not our job. Our job is we are not, our brains are so wired for safety, but that's not really what the whole purpose of being here is about. It's a very small part of things. Um, it should be a very small part of things, right? There are some situations where like domestic violence and war and all these things where safety is very high and very big priority, but let's handle that. Let's, let's, and, and I, I'm, I'm not an expert in war nor domestic violence. So I say nothing further on that because I don't think I'm going to get that right. Um, uh, but this I'll keep you safe is not a thing. And it's, it's counterintuitive. Our brains need to learn what safety really is, right? Most of us are safe right now, in this moment right now. Do we feel safe? 
And if you're, if it's true, your brain's doing a good job. If right now you're not safe, your brain is working accurately. It's time to listen to it, right? And it's appropriate to be in a survival state at this point if it's not safe. But right now in this very moment, if you're actually safe and you feel like you're not safe, your brain is not making accurate interpretations, but it's making accurate interpretations based on what's moving through your nervous system. And so we want to help it resolve those things so that it can come to clarity and it can learn what to do with those things in the nervous system, which one of those things is release it. Another one of those things is make it more accurate. It's, it's powerful. It's wonderful. But we're not here to keep each other safe. I mean, you know, um, that's not the only thing we're here for. That's, <laughs> there we go. That's why it's a distortion because there's some truth to it, right? But not like you don't get to stretch it and make it what it's not and make, and make all these behavioral changes in the safety thing. It, just because it's this much true doesn't mean it covers everything. It's not that much true. And that's the distortion factor is you take this thing and you stretch. Well, if it applied over here, it applies over here too. No, no, actually it doesn't. And that's how post-traumatic stress disorder takes up more and more of our lives and starts impacting the people around us. And, and hey, and that's the other piece is that um, even if it is impacting the people around you, that's how we're created. So let's not have so much shame about that. Let's just process this. Because if you can give people these challenges with their nervous system, you can also be part of the solution. And I think that's what we're meant to do here. Yeah, if you were to see how quickly this resolves and how beautifully this resolves and how this results in so much growth and connection and wellness, I mean, I don't want to have a cavalier relation, you know, um, uh, attitude about this but sometimes i think we could step into an alternate universe and be like oh yeah no problem all that trauma no problem i mean it's just mind-blowing like stuff that i think should end all things does not and actually becomes very very beautiful brains are designed to do that so these are three more agreements i want you to be aware of and i want you to look out for it, and i want you to start questioning and i want you to don't quite go for it hmm, something's not right with this uh, feel free to call these out in your mind. Feel free to set boundaries. Feel free to keep people in the distance where they're where they have skills for or where they're in a brain state for. Um, definitely don't make agreements to keep people safe. It's not it's their brain really needs to do that. So if this is something that you really feel like it's time for you to heal and you want to resolve these issues, you want to get rid of the need for these agreements and you want to get rid of the symptoms that that make you live here or that keep you in a survival state or that keep recycling like flashbacks and and um, and triggers and anxiety and depression and um, shame and guilt. If you're ready to resolve that, this is exactly what I help people do. And if you want to see if I can help you with that, I invite you to grab a spot on my calendar. And you can do that by going to rachelmcleod.com forward slash call. I've put that up in the header. That's there. Um, if, you, if, if it's time for you to heal, and I would say it is, absolutely jump on my, take me up on this. Let's have a conversation. Um, I'll look at where you are right now, what symptoms you want to get rid of, and I'll help you create a step-by-step -step plan that will get you where you want to go. And if I can help you with that, I will show you exactly what that looks like. There's a couple of ways to work with me and to use my program and to really um, use the things that I have tested and trialed and that are working for other people to do the specific brain work that helps your brain resolve the symptoms at the root. And so we'll talk about that as, as well. And if that's not the right fit for you, that's okay. We will, we will find a plan that works for you. So um, that's my invitation to you. Um, these are the agreements. There are quite a few comments. I'm going to go ahead and answer those and look through those. Okay. Um, okay, some of them are comments, So and I love them. Um, and there's a lot, so... Um, okay. Um, Alex says you're wonder, a wonderful example of someone practicing their professional practice authentically. Um, PTSD is a real thing for me. Studying your work has been extremely help helpful. Wonderful. 
Um, I am absolutely somebody who um, practices this. Um, I was severely mentally ill, much more mentally ill than most people would have recognized and, um, and much more traumatized than I recognized or other people recognized. And um, being unwell is not for me. <laughs> I just know. Um, and, um, and to have the power to change that is, means the world to me. And to be able to share those skills and those tools and the strategies also means the world to me. And I find these, these tools so precious. Um, I don't just hand them out for free because they are so precious and I want them valued and I want them utilized and I want people to break free. Um, that's why I have a conversation <laughs> with people and why I invite people for a conversation because I want to see if this is something you're ready for. Because I'm not handing this to people that it's not ready for because it's, it's right, the letting people in all the way, right? Let's have some, let's make sure it's the right time. Um, it's the right thing that you need. So, um, so absolutely, this is, this has meant the world to me. So um, I, Alex says, I deal with deeply conditioned panic. Absolutely. Um, that's a hard one. Um, panic is a really hard one, but there's so many strategies that um, really help you get ahead of this so that it, there are panic attacks that people have that cannot be addressed in the moment. I like to give people tools. I like to equip them with what we're going to do in the moment when this thing hits. Okay, let's go. We have a plan. We run the plan. It works for lots of people. Um, and But it's not. It's actually not even the, the most awesome plan. It's just a good plan. When you're in a panic attack, it's nice to come out of the panic attack, right? And as quickly as possible. Um, but sometimes you get into such a panic that you can't You've lost your prefrontal cortex. You can't even remember which intervention you were going to do when anyway. Um, and so that's not going to work for you. Uh, we, need a we need strategies that work for you. Um, and there's so many ways to get ahead of this so that you don't have to, so that you can still resolve a panic attack even though you're not in a panic attack. And, um, and those strategies are so, that's the, those are the ones that I would recommend that you want to start untangling the panic attacks before they even arrive. Um, when we do this, what happens is, is that I, I think about this as like the, the neural pathways are just wired really tight. It's like you have a trigger to panic attack. It's like there's just, it's just instant. And there's, it's a, it's a hard and fast flow and it's just off. And once you start resolving this panic attack um, before it happens, you start to put some space in here. And in this space, this is where you can start using an intervention. But before then, it really doesn't work like that. And so here, and then a lot of times you can use an intervention and change what's happening in the moment, which is really, really powerful. But ultimately, um, to, you want to find the root of this. And the root of this is available in the moment, but it's very hard to do root work in the middle of a panic attack or even as the panic attack is calming down. You really want to get into, you want to, you want to work on this thing after it, um, yeah, it usually ends up after it because you'll look back at it. Sometimes you can look forward at it. You can do before the panic attack happens. Um, but after is really nice. Um, it's a really great place to work. And, um, and here is where you can get enough clues to get yourself to the root issue and resolve that. Um, there are specific strategies for this. And um, I, I teach the strategies in layers because you need to have specific skills to go after a root. Um, and that's why in my program, the very first skill is, um, is um, my brain doesn't want to cooperate with me. Um, it's, it's, used, it's, it's working on um, the, the cognitive issues and the somatic issues, the body stuff. So we're starting to learn that stuff. Um, the survival system, there we go. It's, it's really, not the SMAC. We're working on the, the conscious mind and the survival system. We're learning how to work with those um, and solve problems in your life right away because we want to get results moving immediately. But it's important that you know how to work with those two parts of you. And then the next one, we're working on that, but we're working on that in some events. And that's when things get very, very powerful and there's lots of deep transformation. And then the third one, that's when we're learning to work with the subconscious mind and the body. All of those pieces really come together so that you can really start to take down 
the subconscious programming involved with panic attacks. And, um, and, and there's a root in there usually. It might be a past event. It might be a belief. It might be, we don't know what it is. That's why it's important to be equipped with all these strategies and skills so that when you get in there to do the root work, you can, you're effective and you're, you're ready to deal with that. And, um, but what's cool is while people are building these skills, they're already doing the healing work. It's already happening. Um, they're already getting wonderful results and, um, people have, gosh, resolved some really massive things in the first week, two weeks, three weeks of the program. So, um, and it's designed to, it's a, it's a full end to end system. So what I'm telling you, I'm rambling about my system because it is fabulous. Um, it's transformational. I get emails about that frequently. I love that. Um, but it's, I really want you to see that there, there's pretty intense and not intense, but advanced skills here that make this work, um, this heavy lifting easy. Um, no matter how deep it is in your nervous system, that it can be resolved really, really, really nicely. So, um, but you have to do the work to build the skill. And there's, I don't see a way around that, but I'm only one professional in a world of professionals. So that's my opinion. I'm sharing it. Um, let's see. Um, he's, Alex says, we have needs, but not need you to. Um, that's, that's, that's right. That's well said. Um, we do have needs. Um, and it's really important that you categorize needs accurately. Um, needs are things like food, water, shelter, oxygen. Um, uh, those are really those are really needs. Um, um, other things are not. Other things are actually wants, and we want them to stay in the want category. That doesn't make them less important. Many family systems, they if you don't need it, then it's not important. That's not true. That's not healthy. I don't care. I'm saying that just like that. Um, and lots of people will move things in because of this, um, lots of people will move things into the need category so it has importance and validity. But the things are valid just because you wanted them, period. And, and if you do actually need them, great. And, but it's a really, it's a great place to say, it, well, you don't have to provide this for me. I can provide this for myself or I have another relationship that will provide this for me or another relationship and everything's consensual. Um, that I'm, 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 we're exchanging this stuff consensually, not I'm forcing and I'm desperate and they're, you know, that's, that's a whole different thing. And, um, that's, that is, you're invoking choice, right? I can choose, I can choose to get it from you. I can choose this. I can, that's from the front of the brain. That's not a survival state. The survival state, there is no choice. Survival systems are not choice centers. So, um, if you're actually using choice, that means you're working from uh, the right part of the brain for this. Um, different parts of the brain are great for different situations in our life. Um, and making agreements is really a great thing for the front of our brain activity. Okay, so um, um, Alex says, I believe boundaries are really the frames for intimacy. Absolutely. Um, I agree. This is a learning project. Um, your work is helpful in a difficult field. Yes, boundaries are really powerful. Um, your teaching on boundaries are fire for <laughs> increasing intimacy. I'm extremely impressed. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. I didn't mean to, I just reading this, but um, boundaries increase your mental fortitude because we have learned how to appropriately use them. So we're actually safer and better able to get our needs met appropriately, actually knowing how to establish confidence and health. Yes. Um, very well said. Um, and boundaries really come from that, that mental fortitude. So it's boundaries are like a loop. It's like they increase your mental fortitude, but they also are product of your mental fortitude. That's a loop you want your brain working from. That's a healthy loop. Um, our skill level needs to keep up with our agreement. Yep. Skills are a prerequisite for deep intimacy. Absolutely. Um, I don't know that in, in that um, traumatized people in relationships, and I speak from knowledge uh, on this experience, um, are doing intimacy. I just don't think that's that's actually happening. I think there's a certain level of love and commitment, but I don't know that intimacy is actually happening. Thoughts from Rachel? Um, oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. You're on fire tonight. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, all right. Um, wonderful connecting with you all. I would love to hear your thoughts, your experiences with boundaries, with um, these kinds of agreements, with agreements that you found to be healthy. Um, maybe tricks you've learned that have gotten you out of these things, how you have healed, or if you need to heal, um, your experiences as someone with PTSD, or your experience loving someone with PTSD. I'm, I'm interested. I'd love to hear your comments. Go ahead and share those. And um, I, you can drop them in the comments. I will, I'm paying attention. Okay, and I'll, I'll comment on them back. Talk to you soon. Have a good night. Bye.